Hey folks, welcome to this section on prompt engineering and now we're going to be primarily focusing on how to write great prompt. Now note that prompt engineering in 2023 and prompt engineering in 2024 are significantly different primarily because when the models first came out in 2023 our focus was more to write detailed prompt in order to guide the machine. But as of 2024 over the year models have evolved significantly and a lot of pre-processing happens on the uh, model side. So your prompts don't need to be as detailed as they were supposed to be last year. This may still be the case for image generation prompts, but it's not very detailed as detailed as it come, you know, was in the 2023 year itself. So there are six steps or six instructions that OpenAI tells us when it comes to writing prompts in general across image, text and video and audio and so on and so forth. So we start by these, you know, we go through these six steps. In 2023, there was this whole act as hack and, you know, where you tell the model to act as the act as a role and then you would write a very detailed prompt with respect to every single thing right but that's not what you need to do today prompt engineering has got very simpler and even the most simplest of prompts if they are clear can give you great output so we deep dive into the first strategy here that is write clear instructions right and i'm going to show you examples for each of these as well so you know, in, if you look at what the model or open AI says is that the models can't read your mind. If outputs are wrong, you know, outputs are long, ask for brief replies. If outputs are too simple, provide some sort of guidance. You know, it's not, it's not a lie that models can't read your mind. So if the overall output is long, you know, ask for brief replies. If you think that the output given by chat GPT is too short, you'd ask for a longer reply. If you dislike the format, you'd specify a sample format. The less the model have to, has to guess, the better output it will throw out. Effectively, that's what OpenAI says when it comes to writing the prompts themselves. And I think it makes sense, right? Note that context. Note that the context that model has at any point of time, context meaning the total number of words that it can take and give at any point of time is limited. So if you're writing large prompts, or if you're writing short prompts, what will matter in the end is how clear your instructions are. If you write a 200 word prompt, but you still haven't specified the sample format that you want output in, it's still going to give you wrong output. So it's important that we kind of look at the very basics of what we are looking to get from the model and then kind of, you know, detail of the detail out the prompt if we need in the first place. So these are the six tactics that OpenAI team suggests. Number one is include details in your query to get more. And we'll look at each of the examples. So don't worry. Ask the model to adopt a persona. This is again similar to the act as hack, but act as hack was way more detailed, right? So effectively what it was, I'm going to give you a very quick overview. Act as hack was when you would tell model to pretend to be someone, and then you would give some details with respect to what that person would do. So let's say if you are a product manager, a product manager would do A, B, C. Now all of that ABC was a bit irrelevant because the model already knows about what a product manager is. Back then you would have to feed prompts like those in order to get good outputs. Right now the model is adapted to kind of, you know, do some pre-processing steps. So for example, if you say you are a product manager, it knows what a product manager is, is one of the previous steps. So it will figure out who you're talking about and then give you output based on that. So you don't need to have the prompt as detailed as they should be, as they were in 2023. If I Third is ask the, you know, use delimiters to clearly indicate distinct parts of the input. Delimiters are nothing but placeholders. So basically, for example, I want you to write two social media posts in this format. So format one and give me description. So format two and give me description. So think of it as placeholders of where you want and how you want the output to be. Fourth is specify steps required to complete a task. So let's say you uh, you think that you're, what you're doing re would require you to first do research and then give you output. What you tell the model is, you know, first go ahead and do research on Bing, figure out what are the top 10 automobile sales in the US, for example, and then based on those top 10 sales, do analysis, right? So giving out steps can also help the model to kind of refer to steps and then first do step one and then go ahead and do step two. Fifth is provide examples. It's ideal to kind of give out examples 
example so if you're talking about things that can be confusing in a na- confusing in nature so let's say two things are called exactly the same but can have different meaning it's important that you kind of give some examples so that the model can have reference points so let's say you're talking about a company name and both of these company names are same you can give some examples with respect to say example company one has launched this product right so some reference with respect to that example can also go a long way because the model will be able to give you then clear output Sixth is specify the desired length of the output. Now this is a little bit of a question for me. While it will follow, let's say if you wanted to write one thousand word article, it will definitely kind of you know take in as an instruction and try to achieve that. But the model context limit or the output it can give out is limited, so it will not give out one thousand word article because if if the limit is smaller than what you want it to generate, right? So again, it's more on the lines of border where you also have to ensure that the limit. is larger and that you know you also pass this as a parameter let's look at the examples for each of these and then move on to the second strategy all right so this is the first tactic where you know you want to kind of include better details so rather than saying how do i add numbers in excel you can say how do i add up a row of do- dollar amounts in excel i want to do this automatically for whole sheet of rows with all the totals ending up on the right column called total now I've seen a lot of students who will just go ahead and you know right can you add up the dollar amounts in excel now the issue that can happen is that you know it will give out wrong output and then you would write some more details right so you would iteratively write second prompt and then you would iteratively iteratively write you know third prompt it makes sense to invest some time and write the first prompt correctly so that you know you don't have to go through this barrage of back and forth when it comes to generating the output itself second who's president i i think it's pretty straightforward who was the president of mexico in 2021 would give you better output or maybe in the us and so on and so forth right code to calculate the fibonacci sequence write a type script functionality so this is important you have to specify what language we you're looking at comment the code liberally to explain what piece does and why it's written that way so this way you are very clearly specifying what you want rather than just saying that can you write uh, the code for x so let's say you write the uh, instruction as write code to calculate fibonacci series you would then write a follow up after the output can you write this in type script and then when the output is generated you will not understand what is generated so you'll say can you also give me comments with respect to what you've generated and that way you're writing three prompts and wasting more time and you know ha- having more computational problems and so on so it's better that you kind of focus on you know invest some time maybe a few more seconds to write a detailed prompt summarize the meeting notes rather than that can you you know you can go ahead and say summarize the meeting notes in a single paragraph then write a markdown list of speakers and list you know each of their key points finally list the next steps or action items suggested by the speakers if any so this is for include details as for the persona when i ask for help to write something you will reply with a document that contains at least one joke or playful comment in every paragraph so this is the common instruction this is something that you want the model to follow all the time now as a prompt what you can say write a thank you note to my steel bolt vendor you can see we've specifically given that name instead of saying write a thank you note i did specifically specifying the persona that we're targeting here for getting the delivery in on time and the task that has been completed and in short notice this made it possible for us to deliver an important order now when the thank you note is written it will take into consideration each of these things that you gave to the model rather than just writing a generic thank you note which which wouldn't have made as much impact now that you're writing exactly what has been done it kind of adds way more value to the person reading it and you because you know you invested some time to generate a good output per se third is using placeholders or delimiters i mentioned this earlier that let's say you're writing two paragraphs so effectively what you will do is you will tell chat gpt to insert article 1 above and article 2 below so effectively it's just using placeholders so may, maybe you were writing a blog and you have a specific format to follow let's say leave this area for images or leave this area for heading 2 or write heading to here and leave this area for images and that's something that you can do using these type of delimiters so maybe you're writing an html format for a blog then maybe you can leverage something like this even if you're not you're using markdown like a p or a image and so on and so forth 
then you can kind of go ahead and leverage this specify steps i mentioned for one of the bing examples where you can tell model to first do research and second then you know go ahead and so you can see the example used here is that step one the user will provide you with the text in triple quotes summarize this text in one sentence with a prefix that says summary text to translate the summary of step one into spanish with a prefix that says translation so you can see specifying the steps will help a model to execute them in a sequential format rather you know if you don't do this then it's possible that the model will just do what it feels best and it will maybe not follow one of your steps and then you'll have to tell it to kind of generate again next is provide examples you can see the user started with answer in a consistent style then it says teach me about patients so there was this paragraph that was written about patients and now you you can leverage that paragraph so teach me about the ocean will now use the previous generation, the river calves, the deepest valley as an example and generate the output for you. So having some reference with respect to what you're looking for can also go a long way, primarily because the model will have some starting point to begin with in scenarios versus scenarios where it is looking to generate every new thing from scratch. Then finally specifying words, this is the simplest hack that you can think of, right? If you if you want to write an introduction for your LinkedIn profile, it's important that you double quote or, you know, kind of go ahead and add certain words, the amount of words that you're looking for. Otherwise the model is going to have like an open generation and then you'll have to do a, back, a bunch of back and forth in order to kind of get the right generation in place. So these are the six tactics for the first instruction. And now we're going to be moving on to the second strategy where we'll also look at more examples on how to find you know prompt better so chat gpt and any open source model text model right now works primarily on the idea of vectors so what that means is for example if you tell it to generate something it very likely does not know what it means but rather it knows that these words or the combination of words probability wise definitely makes sense and should be uh, in the desired order, which is exactly why every time you would ask the same question, it will give you output that is not exactly the same as the previous output. It's because it knows what it's generating is it, it does not understand what it's generating, right? But it knows that the probability of these words existing together is high. So just if you, if I have to give you like a very, very high level summary, summary of how it works, it is all math. You would see words, creative things, but in the end it's complete math, which is exactly why language models can generate wrong things very confidently, especially about topics or for citation, citations and URL in the same way that a sheet of notes can help a student to do better in the test reference text allows chat GPT to give out less fabricated or fewer fabricated answers. This is the second strategy that OpenAI shares, provide reference text. Now this, this has two tactics, instruct the model to answer using a reference text. And this also has use cases in places where you want to write blogs, let's say, right? So if you say, can you write a blog on say snappy AI, which is the AI video generation tool, it will go ahead and, you know, write the blog based on its best understanding of AI video generation. It will also include features that you don't have, right? So it does not make sense to kind of having those in your blogs in the first place. So what reference text can do, and I've been using it for very, very long time now, reference text can help you generate output that is well suited for you and is not fabricated. A fabrication would be adding a feature that your pl platform does not have. So it's pretty straightforward. Every time you want to write a piece of content, you know, go ahead and write instructions with respect to what you want the model to do but also at the same time say this is the reference text that you should use in order to generate the model now the reference text will should not contain like everything that you you know want to write in the blog but rather some very very high level understanding this is also great at repurposing the content let's say you have an an old blog written for say five year old kids. Now you want to repurpose a similar blog for say a 50 year old person, then you can go ahead and you know, use that five year old blog as a reference and you can say, you, can you write a blog on 50 year old? So that way, you know, the model knows the boundaries of which it should go to when it's kind of referring the content for writing the blog, the immediate context that you share with the model will have way more weightage with versus the already pre 
existing information in the model itself. Now let's look at the examples that were shared here. The first one was the reference text, which is something that we already spoke about. You need to kind of share some reference with respect to what you want to generate. So use the provider articles delimited by triple quotes to answer questions. If the answer cannot be found in the articles, right? I could not find the answer. So that way it will only look through the articles and not give you fabricated answer. This is also good when it comes to, let's say you write, you have a FAQ for your own product. You have a chat GPT bot, right? So effectively what you want the model to do is only look at your product documentation and not give out answers that it already knows. So let's say if a user is asking a question that is not existing in your documentation, you would never want model to lie to your potential customer. So broadly, that's how you can use reference text. And it's obviously useful to kind of, you know, ensure that the fabricated answers are not given to the users in the first place. Second is reference pointers, where you can also share documents with respect to the answer that you want it to give out. So second is the reference points. You will be provided with a document delimited by triple quotes. Your task is to answer the question only using the provided documents and cite the passages of documents used to answer that question. If a document does not have this, then you have to write insufficient information. If an answer uh, to the question is provided, it must be annotated with the citation, use the following format. So basically this will, you know, what it will do is follow the format of the output that, you know, in which to give to the end user. So let's say if the end user is asking, what is the, so let's say if the end user is asking, are there any discounts? The model will go ahead and give out the output and also cite the paragraph, exactly the paragraph that it referred to in order to give that answer out. So it's extremely useful to ensure that whatever the model is giving out as an output does uh, actually make sense and is something that the user should be looking at in the first place. So again, this is very useful from writing blogs or writing social media posts or preparing custom chatbots and so on and so forth. Having reference point makes it very easy for model to ensure that the output is in the uh, expected format. Third, and I think this is one of the most important strategy is to split complex tasks into smaller chunks. So just as uh, you know, as a software developer or a content writer, you would first write an outline or as a software developer, you would go ahead and modularize your code into smaller sections. As a content writer, you would, you know, outline first paragraph, second paragraph It's important that you deal with problems in a more modularized format. If you don't know how to modularize your problem, what you can do is you can use chat GPT help to break the problem down and then tackle that problem one by one, right? Primarily because if you tell ChatGPT to write a code for an entire web page with, you know, button functionality, doing something, navbar having something or a, you know, footer having something, it's not going to work because it's, it has too many problems to tackle at single point of time. It's rather ideal to, let's say, focus on the navbar first, then the main component second, then the third component, fourth component, so on and so forth. So there are three good tactics that are also before I go there, you can see the complex tasks tend to have higher error rates uh, than the simpler tasks. Furthermore, complex, complex tasks can often be redefined as a workflow of simpler tasks in which the outputs of the earlier tasks are used to construct the inputs to the later on. So let's say if you generate like the first paragraph of the blog, you can always use the first generated paragraph as the input to the next generating paragraph because you want it to seem in sync, right? In one way or the other. So it's important that, um, you know, you use these uh, basic ideas to kind of improve the final output that what, whatever you're trying to generate in the first place. So there are three tactics shared by OpenAI here. First is use intent classification to identify the most relevant instructions for a user query. Second, for dialogue applications that, you know, require very long conversation, summarize very little filter, filter previous dialogue and then, you know, use that as an input. Third, summarize long document piecewise and construct a full summary recursively. So again, last two are similar in a way where you use the reference of the previous output as an input. But in the third tactic, you would basically, you know, just generate each of these in isolation. And I'm going to show you an example here as well. So let's start by using the or understanding the intent classification first. Basically, you know, let's say you're creating like an FAQ chatbot, you will be provided with customer uh, service queries, classify each into primary category and secondary category. And then you would see that, you know, 
billing secondary categories and then there are primary categories which are billing technical support account management general query and then these have sub uh, categories right so there is the kind of questions that the user can ask when it comes to these categories per se so first is intent classification let's say you have already set up something of a chatbot of sorts for your customers to answer queries now there are two categories of queries the user can ask the first is primary where it's billing technical type of queries account management or general queries and second there are sub categories of these primary queries so billing secondary categories secondary technical support categories and so on and so forth now let's say the user is asking i need to get my internet working again you can see you know the intent is to not look through 100 categories rather we are specifying that we only need to look at the internet working category so it will directly look at the technical support secondary categories and find the answer there rather if the user were to say i need to get my issue uh, you know some issue fixed that way uh, there is no context with respect to what the issue is or maybe you can say i am not able to use the web browser right so again the direct question to ask here would be to see my internet is i need to get my internet working again that that way the model can focus on what to answer at that specific point of time so the intent here is to fix the internet and it it makes it easier for the model to answer that question rather than when you ask like an open ended question so next is breaking down the text itself and we're going to be taking both the examples in the same example right here let's say you were writing an ebook for ebook outline for children in ai so in, instead of saying can you write an entire ebook you, what you can say is you can start by outline write an outline for an ebook for a 5 year old trying to learn ai and then it will give you a list of 10 topics that it thinks is a great outline for you to start off with then you know you can use the first chapter and then tell it to detail out more details with respect to that chapter right that way you are approaching the problem in isolation and then you are also kind of in the because you are in the same chat it has some context with respect to what you are doing in the first place but the second tactic also tells you to kind of take the summary input from the previous paragraph and feed that as an input to the next paragraph in those scenarios what you can also do is you can use some text from the previous paragraph and when you are telling it to generate chapter 2 you can say this was the chapter 2 i want you to sorry this was the chapter 1 i want you to generate chapter 2 here is some reference from chapter 1 that way it knows some context with respect to the previous input as well and it will give out decent output as versus when you know you give out an input that is in isolation if your task requires you to generate things in isolation then it It makes sense to kind of give out things in isolation. Let's say you are writing a maths book for five-year-olds. That way, the previous input may not be necessarily connected to the next uh, input. So, in those sense, it makes sense to kind of deal with these problems in isolation. But in scenarios where you need some context, it's important that you put in some summary paragraph as an input to the next text. And I think these are two broad strategies when it comes to these two broad, three broad tactics when it comes to this strategy. Let's move on to the next. strategy now so just like humans models also require time to think and the reason is simple they can't reason what they will give you as an answer is that is something that is already available as a part of their history that they may, they may have found on the internet so when you say 10 into 20 is equal to 200 even if the model is giving you that answer it's not 100% certain if that's the correct answer so it's always ideal for, for the model to kind of go through some reasoning of sorts before the answer is shared with the end user so let's say, let's take the example that was shared by Uh, the open ai team if asked to multiply 17 into 28 you might not know it instantly but can still work it out with time similarly models uh, make more reasoning errors when trying to answer right away rather than taking time to work out an answer asking for a chain of thought before an answer can help the model reason its way toward the correct answers more reliably again it's not certain it's reliable there are three tactics that open ai team suggest you follow here instruct the model to work out its own solution before rushing to a conclusion second use inner monologue or a sequence of queries hide the models to hide the models reasoning and ask the model if it missed anything in the previous passes so let's look at each of these examples now number one is the you know having like a sequence of chain of thought in before the answer is generated by the model so determine if the student solution is correct or not problem statement was that i'm building a solar power installation and need help working out the financials so these are the land cost 
solar panels cost per square feet and then i negotiated a contract for maintenance that will cost me 100k per year and a negotiate and an additional 10 dollars square feet the first thought that i have at least that solar panels are very expensive so what is the total cost for the first year of operation as a function of the number of square feet student solution you know will be land cost is equal to 100x where x in indicates the square feet solar panel is 250x maintenance cost is 100 100k plus you know 100x and then you know the actual cost or total cost will be 450x plus 100k the model will then tell you uh, if the answer is correct or not alternatively what you can also do is you can tell the model to kind of go through the steps of getting to the answer so rather than saying that this is the input can you generate the output or can you give me the final cost you can say can you can you build a chain of thought for me to get to the answer a chain of thought would be something like this where you specify very clearly the values for each of the parameters and by the end you will get the final answer and the model can also cross reference as it's generating the content to ensure that the consistency of the answer is maintained second is internal monologue um, where effectively you want the model to go through certain steps in before it generates the final output itself but you don't necessarily want to see what the model is generating that's where you would use something called an internal monologue to hide the reasoning behind how it how the answer is generated so your first step would be to find work out first work out your own solution to the problem don't rely on student solution since it may be incorrect compare your solution to this and you know student solution and then evaluate if the student solution is correct or not third if a student made a mistake determine what hint you could give the student without giving away the answer enclose all your work for the step within triple code so you don't necessarily want to see what the model is generating but you want it to reason before before, or you want it to kind of go through a step of steps per se not before it kind of generates the output. If the student made a mistake, provide the hint from the previous step to the student instead of writing step four, write hint. So basically we don't want you, the student to know that you know that all of these calculations are happening in the back end. So rather we want to keep it more user friendly and show hint rather than saying this, is, this was the step four. So broadly think of it as a system in the back end that is going through X steps before you know if, if in final step where it will evaluate if the answer is correct or not and give you out a hint if your answer is incorrect and then the user would feed in problem statement and student solution and then all of these four steps will be uh, processed as the problem statement and student solutions are shared with the machine itself that way you don't see what the model is doing or how extensively model is doing calculation but you would be able to understand if the solution that is reached is relevant relatively more reliable than it would otherwise. Finally, you know, asking if something was missed is the, I think it is, is the final and finally asking if something was missed. Now, given that the model is going through a bunch of steps where before it generates the final output, it makes sense to have a follow-up question where you would ask if something, you know, across these steps was missed and needs to be taken in, taken into consideration. So the system setting that you would set is you will be provided with document delimited by triple quotes. Your task is to select excerpts which pertain to the following question. What significant paradigm shifts have occurred in the history of artificial intelligence? Ensure that all, you know, ensure that excerpts contain all relevant context needed to interpret them. In other words, don't extract small snippets that are missing important context. Provide output in JSON format as well. So basically we giving out a bunch of information with respect to what we want it to generate and then after you can you can see after the excerpts are generated we will ask a follow-up question are there any more relevant excerpts take care of take care not to repeat excerpts also ensure that excerpts contain all relevant information needed to interpret them so effectively after the output is generated you would uh, add a follow-up input saying that if there was something that was missed can you you know look through the solution steps and give out if, the, if there was something that was missed and if there's something that was wrong in the first place so this this follow-up can help ensure that everything you need in order to cover a paper or a research of sorts is covered in the first place itself so again these were the fourth three strategies or three tactics of the fourth strategy where you give model some time to think now we'll move on to the fifth one now we're looking at number five giving access to external tools 
So given that the model context window is limited, you know, in nature, because the model can only accept and give out the certain length of the input and output, you can leverage tools to make the both input and output way more relevant. So let's say you have a 1000 page PDF or a 1000 page ebook that, and you want to create like a question and answer chatbot based on that ebook, you can use a rag or sometimes also referred to as retrieval augmented generation to, you know, for example, if I'm asking about chapter eight, a rag can look at chapter eight and only give out that paragraph as an input to the model. So you can use external tools like these in order to generate relevant documentations. And again, both of the next point five and six are relevant more from the API standpoint than general chat perspective. You can also leverage tools that are internal to chat GPT like OpenAI's own op you know, code interpreter code interpreter can help the model do math and run code. If something can that, if there's something that can be done using these external APIs, OpenAI recommends that you use those rather than expecting the LLM to kind of generate that output for you. So there are three tactics to look at here. First is to use embeddings based search to implement efficient knowledge retrieval. So again, these are more technical in nature. Effectively, what you would do in embeddings is you would break down a large document into smaller pieces of text and then each of these texts will be assigned a vector. Vector is basically the distance between two texts that gives out probability about how connected these two pieces of text are. Then when a question is asked, the OpenAI model will look at a specific vector that is the most closest to that specific question being asked. So let's say I'm asking about what, what is you know outlined in chapter 8. The model will look at chapter 8 vector and the question that I'm asking, calculate the distance between two if the probability of these two being closest is high, then it will reference that paragraph and give out, give that paragraph as an input in order to generate the output. That way, even if a book is say 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 PDF long, it will associate each of the chapters with vectors and then still give you the relevant information as the output. So it's, it's almost like you have access to the entire book at this point. Second is to use code execution to perform accurate calculations. That's something you can already do on OpenAI. If you choose data analysis, or code interpreter, it will run the code in the same ecosystem. And finally, give model access to specific functions. So functions are basically small pieces of code or tasks that you want to achieve. Let's say you want to you know, generate something and do some basic custom calculation based on that. You can specify a small function saying that maybe customize this for my company, right? So let's say this a URL, there was a URL that was generated and you want to change something in the URL to suit how your company accepts URL you can add that function as an extra step in the execution itself. Let's look at one example here and then there's not much to discuss. This is because this is primarily more around code. But anyways, we're going to be looking at some examples that are shared by the team here. So the first example is you can write the write and execute Python code by enclosing it in triple backticks. The code goes here is where you would put this data, right? So use this to perform calculations. Find all real valued real valued roots of the following polynomial. Now what this will effectively do is that it will create like a code section. Let me just show you. And that section would look something like this. You can see this is this is the area where the code is generated and then you can copy this code and then you know you can paste it again but the idea is that this becomes this this area is almost like a terminal of sorts where it will execute the commands that you pass to the model itself you can also do that for math problems and you can also do that for writing code itself. So again, there's not much in this section because this is primarily technical in nature and would require you to do even further research with respect to your use case. But just know that everything or every model right now works with the logic of embeddings. They can't reason. They don't know what they're writing, but they probability wise, they know that these two words are clo closest and that's what they are generating in the output. So you finally reached the final point of prompt engineering. For text especially, over the next few sections, you'll learn more about the image generation in prompt engineering. But the idea has been that, you know, even if you knew what prompt engineering was in 2023, it has now significantly changed in 2024 and it will continue to change as years go by, right? So either ways, the sixth point kind of tells us to kind of test changes systematically. Now, basically improving a performance is relatively easier when you can measure it. And in some cases, modification 
application to a prompt will achieve better performance and we'll talk about an example here as well and it can also lead to bad performance if the prompt is not optimized in a correct format therefore the goal is to ensure that the change is net positive to the you know to performance it may be necessary to define a comprehensive test suit in a way think of it as you know almost like after every answer you need to have some correct reference for the model to know because you know while the model is taking the input from the previous answer and giving you a score of say 1 to 10 you would still want to ensure that if there is going to be a follow up question or if there is someone going to be asking that same question that model know was what the right answer was in the first place right so you know building like a test suit of not only helping the student but also helping the model goes a long way and the tactic here is evaluate the model outputs with reference to the gold standard answers and let's see what that means so you can see you will be provided with text delimited with triple quotes and so on and then there are two pieces of information neil armstrong was the first person to walk on the moon the date neil armstrong first walked on the moon was july 21 1969 each for each of these points perform the following step every time a user is asked this question reinstate the point provide a citation from the answer which is closest to the point so let's say if the user is saying neil armstrong is famous for being the first human to set on the moon this historic event took place in july 21 1969 cite both of these points as correct answers consider if someone who is reading the citation does not know the topic could directly infer the point explain why or why not before making up your mind and then write if the answer to 3 was correct otherwise no so effectively what you are doing is every time a student is asking this question or every time a student is feed, student is feeding some data you can see the user is saying neil armstrong is famous for being the first human to set foot on the moon this historic event took place on july 21 1969 we know both of these points are correct so what the model will uh, give you as an output is these two points as citation you know the neil, that the neil armstrong was the first person to walk on the moon and then the second one and then will add yes as one so that that way when there is someone who's prompting it again with some paragraph and let me show you an example so if the user is giving something like this now you can see only the first part of the piece of information we want is correct so the answer to this will be no but what the model will do is model will give out both points anyway so there will be Uh, neil armstrong was the first person to walk on the moon the date neil armstrong first walked on the moon was july 21 1969 and then Now both of these points will be used as a reference for the model itself with the yes and no count. So let's say yes is now one and no is now one. So model will now know that the previous count of the answer was this, and the next answer will modify this count, either yes or no. So it is using the reference not for not only for the user but also for itself. So ensure you almost set up like a system. that that is like a set of process or execution steps that it needs to go before it gives out the answer to the user and that's i think our final lesson in the prompt engineering area itself i don't think we have any you know anything more to deep dive when it comes to text generation yes we'll deep dive a little bit more when it comes to image generation in the future in order to generate hd images and so on and so forth but as of now i think if you follow these guidelines correctly you're mostly there when it comes to content generation even you you know even when it comes to image generation these guidelines are great because you're still having all of those best practices you know having details having clear instructions in place when it comes to image generation the link to this doc this ppt and the image of you know having like a simple summary is added in the description you can go ahead and access those as well so in this video we'll be looking at what are prompts remember the complete output generated by the model itself depends on the kind of prompt that you input in the model per se so it's very important to know how the prompts are structured in order to generate the perfect out so let's go back to the very basics of prompt and we'll try a bunch of examples that kind of help us guide us through the whole thing post this section what we'll do is we'll go ahead and um, also look at some of the websites that enable us to generate or enable us to visualize the prompts and then use those prompts in order to generate our own avatars so, so the basic idea video which are interested in generative ai and check this course out on udemy so about the world of generative ai every concept that you need to know ai text generation image generation avatar generation ai audio generation and finally video generation so you learn to automate every single bit of content with ai if you're checking out this course it's on discount right now so you may still be able to get your hands on it jump into the video course so the basic idea behind stable diffusion prompts is to guide the generation of the image now this prompt is like a sequence of words that provides context to the 
you know generated image per se the image generator then uses this prompt in order to produce the output that is coherent with the consistent prompt so in a very very layman terms what prompts are is like the set of texts or set of instructions for machine to follow in order to generate that image for you now that said there is some discipline there is some discipline that you should follow in order to generate the right you know correct prompts per se right so these are all the things that these are all the elements that you need to consider in a prompt and this this would you know this is like the descriptive list of all the ideal things that a prompt should have or maybe less less or few less or more depending on what your use case is so the number one thing and the most important and the thing that should the prompt that should definitely have is the subject so it should it could be a person animal or a landscape now in if you're talking about ai avatars the subject primarily has to be you your prompt that you had trained the model on this could be say for example yesterday the prompt that you had entered when training the model or the prompt that the model would already have like superman or maybe a celebrity like john snow or a, or an animal like tiger or a landscape like japan etc etc so the subject needs to be present regardless of what this is the most this is the mandatory thing a prompt should have then followed is a verb which may be you know optional when the what this basically says what the subject is doing right so the subject could be standing sitting or eating or running or riding a cycle whatever right so the so the once you have the subject in place what you need to mention is the verb of what the model or the subject would be doing generally if you add portrait to the prompt it means that the subject is looking at the camera or it's just the first upper half of the body of the subject now after that this the prompt or the model needs to have the adjective this is the quality of the subject per se right so it could be beautiful portrait of yash of the subject meaning beautiful portrait of a tiger beautiful portrait of a dog etc etc realistic big colorful etc so whatever you want the adjective to be for the prompt is what you need to add in the prompt as well so if i were to generate like a sample prompt here let's put all of this together and see what we can generate so you be full of yes the standing environment could be the mostly the background so outdoor underwater in the sky at night etc etc whatever works based on the use case so you can stay uh, at night all of this needs to be separated by comma in case you can kind of create like a small sentence out of it so in this case beautiful portrait of your standing at night is a sentence which will go so this is the context that machine will use either to generate the background or arrange lighting or arrange the context accordingly then you can say the lighting now this is because it's night i'm going to say neon lighting so now it says beautiful portrait of your tree standing at night neon lighting so now you, you can start visualizing in your head how the portrait is going to look right so that's the idea behind this whole thing that you put all of these things together that the machine would then visualize in its own way and generate like a image per se this is fascinating and i know this is fascinating right so now you have to also consider the emotion this could be romantic grim energetic let's say grim so this should generate like a scary portrait now if you if you are visualizing while i'm doing this it says that the beautiful portrait of a yasti standing at night neon lighting grim meaning is looking uh, more from the horror perspective and then you need to take into consideration the uh, art inspiration and like i said the most powerful thing of generative ai is that it can combine the work of multiple artists in order to generate the uh, final picture for you now in this case i'm going to say in the style of arjem gerald broom ate gillian and mike mingola all of these are artists so i want a combination of pictures with these guys in this now also note that there is a limit to the number of characters you can add in a prompt so while i'm trying my best to experiment with what i can here ensure that you kind of limit yourself uh, with respect to the characters you add in the prompt per se now then you have to mention the art medium 
which could be oil on canvas, watercolor sketch, or you can also say comic art or photography. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use comic art, which I've noticed that it does better for my pictures, especially when I have comic art in this. So I'm gonna say comic art, okay. And then there is a photography style. Again, if this is something that you'd want to take into consideration, feel free to. You can use Polaroid, long exposure, monochrome, GoPro, fisheye, bokeh. All of these things would, I think, help your portrait seem more realistic from that extent. So it's the call you'd want to take. Feel free to kind of, you know, do permutation combination depending on what you want to achieve. And then there is an art style, manga, fantasy, minimalism, abstract. So let's try minimalism. I'm, I think I'm going to break my model here, but let's explore the boundaries of what model can do anyways, right? So art style, I've already kind of took comic art, but I want to limit, I want to try to keep it minimalism. Then material could be fabric, wood and clay. Again, this depends on the type of, you know, final image that you want to generate. So it could be on a fabric wood or a clay then color scheme could be pastel vibrant dynamic lighting so i'm gonna say vibrant computer graphics could be 3d octane cycle so i'm gonna skip that basically it will help you generate like a 3d render of sorts octane render or the cycles we have generated so th these are all terms that i'm not completely aware of but you can use these if you understand these right so then there is illustration isometric uh, pixar scientific comic I'm going to use comic that I've already used, right? So that's going to be my illustration. You, in computer graphics, you can also use Unreal Engine 5, which may make it look more realistic uh, from that extent. Finally, talking about quality, you can use high definition. You can use 4K. You can use 8K or 64K. Again, if you have a great GPU or if you bought like a premium plan, all of this would matter to you. In my case, I'm just going to say HD, right? And let's try this prompt. Again, we generated this prompt from scratch, doing nothing. We're gonna use the same negative prompts that have worked better for me. I'm gonna add the link to this sheet in the document and post this by the way, we'll experiment you know, a bit on some of the other functions that you also need to keep in mind. But let's try it with this prompt. Let's quickly wait for the model to generate an output for this. Use 400 into 400. I hope it's not too bad. You can see it generated like an anime character with the hair that are that is close to me. So this one's this one looks super cool. So I'm just gonna take one of the images, right? So this also looks super cool. So you can see that it's a grim face. There is dark lighting. There is neon lighting. Then the person is looking at the camera. I think this is the most realistic that it has generated. So I'm gonna go ahead and save it. But you can see that not all the images match the criteria, right? Regardless, you will see these cases where only few of the images from the render will actually match to what you had requested in the you know prompt itself. So you can play around with this guidance. Case. And this is going to be it for the video itself. If you are interested to learn more about prompts, AI app that generation or generative AI in general, check out the video or the course link in the description. Sign up for the course, it will teach you everything you need to know. It will give you access to hundreds and thousands of prompts to generate whatever you can and cannot think of. So I, if this video helped, consider subscribing to the channel, drop a like on this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much guys.